Awesome, awesome. Great, great. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Fadi. <clears throat> I'm a uh, PM at Microsoft uh, this summer and I'm one of the co-hosts for this interview series. I've got my um, partner in crime, Iris. Hi everyone, I'm Iris. I'm a PM at Google X, the Moonshot Factory this summer. And uh, we're both super excited to host Shannon. And yeah, let's get started. So for this event, um, we're going to, to talk to Shannon, who has a lot of experience um, in PM and also for the past five years in climate. So I'll start off with a question. Um, Shannon, can you tell us a little bit about your journey on a higher level? A higher level, that sounds like a, like a spiritual level or something, but I'll, I'll <laughs> maybe not go that, that route. But um, hello, everybody. Yep, I'm Shannon. So yeah, so I, I, I definitely have sort of a pretty extensive product um, background. I'm definitely newer on the climate side, and, and I'll speak to that. But um, sort of my, my, my life story, um, my undergraduate degree was in computer science. Um, and then I kind of decided I didn't want to be a programmer for my whole life. So I was looking at like, you know, what do I do with computer science? Um, and I found a program called Human Computer Interaction, which was pretty new at the time. Um, it's probably, uh, most of you probably know about it at this point, but it's sort of merging computer science and psychology and design. Um, but I, I got a master's in, in human computer interaction right out of school. Um, and then I, while I was doing internships, actually at DoubleClick, which later got acquired by Google, I, um, I, I ran into my first product manager um, while I was interning in, in the uh, UI department, actually. Um, so I learned about product management. It was really appealing to me. Um, so right out of uh, graduate school, I, my first job was at Google. And Google has a program called the Associate Product Manager uh, role or APM role. Um, and now a lot of companies have a similar APM role. But it's, it's a really cool program where, at least at Google, they assumed it's almost entirely computer science graduates, actually. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the case at other companies. But as people have no product management background, um, but have just an interest in computer science, have an interest in business side of things, have an interest in sort of UI and, and how people interact with software. So, so I jumped to Google, um, was there in the Bay Area for four or five years. Then um, I did a couple startups, um, none of which were super successful, but we can, you know, we can talk about those. Um, I also at that point moved to North Carolina um, and then I joined on as the first hire at a company called Pendo. Um, and I was there for four or five years at, it did really well, it's still doing very well. Um, and towards the end of that, I decided I wanted to start doing climate and, and I can talk more about that. Um, but I jumped to a company called Arcadia, which is sort of bringing renewable energy to, to homeowners and renters. Um, and then I uh, most recently jumped to a company called Carbon Analytics, which is doing sort of carbon footprinting. So anyhow, that's sort of the, the forest view and we can dive into wherever you guys want to dive into. Yeah, for sure. Um, I guess I'll start first in terms of the degree sites. Um, so after doing your bachelor in computer science, why did you pursue a master in HCI? Yeah, so that was like, I, I had been, I'd been doing Actually, I, I started down like the computer science route even before college, like even in high school, I started taking computer science classes at the local university. So I was, I was originally very much planning on doing computer science and like any kid, it was, you know, I think a lot of it was like based on like, oh, I want to build computer games or something like that. Um, but as I got into it, I realized, um, one, people were just, there were people who were just much better programming than me. Um, and two, I realized I didn't honestly care about the things that you should care about in computer science. So like, I didn't care about like learning new languages. I didn't care about like optimizing algorithms, like all the stuff that a good engineer should care about. I didn't care about all I cared about kind of was like the end result, which is like, I want cool products at the end of the road. So I still code sometimes I, I use PHP for, and for anybody who's out there, like probably shouldn't be building modern web apps in, in PHP, but I just don't care because it's, you know, it's, it's the language is not what I care about. I care about uh, a, a product. Um, and so at some point, like I said, I realized I didn't care much about that side of things. I cared about, you know, the, the, the experience, the user experience, you know, the people side of it. Um, so, so that's where I sort of started looking around and, and found HCI and, and really fell in love with what that was all about. So taking 
when you decided to do your master's because you wanted to get a little bit more involved in the user experience and getting closer to the customer or the user, um, why, and, and you mentioned that you did an internship at, at DoubleClick, and, which was like the ads business for Google. Um, why did you pursue uh, Google as your full-time job and why PM? And you, pr you peppered that PM part a little bit previously. Yeah. Um, so let's see. So yeah, at my, one of my internships, as I mentioned, I encountered product management and it just felt like that perfect intersection for me of like technical background was really valuable. User facing was really valuable. Um, caring about businesses was really valuable. Uh, and I did at my grad school, I, I took, I actually got like a certificate, which is sort of like one level lower than a minor, but basically like a, a a certificate in, um, in, in business classes and an MBA certificate. So I had an MBA certificate, a computer science background. Um, I had sort of a design background as well. And so all these things um, in hindsight, like especially being part of like recruiting at Google yeah, and client. seeing sort of what they're looking for in hindsight, it was like the exact perfect mashup for what a product manager is, right? Caring about the user, as Fatty said, caring about the business um, and, and having some technical background. It was just sort of like, exactly the, the the model that a lot of especially the more technical companies are looking for um for a product manager so so yeah as far as google um i think part of it was just they had the apm program which didn't require a, a background in product management so it was one of the few places at that time where i could actually jump straight in um and like lots of people at that time it was sort of like i don't know i just put all my eggs in that basket and, and it worked out <laughs> Um, I think I, I think I got in by like the skin of my teeth, honestly. Like, I think I was right on the border, but um, I, I was competing against all these like Stanford, MIT, Harvard people, and I did not have a pedigree from any of those places. And actually, I was I was one of only two people in the entire program who were not from one of those three places. It was me and a University of Waterloo person um, came in as like the experiment outside of Stanford, MIT, Harvard. So um, worked out for me though. When you say a background of products, a lot of people that come from, um, and I know there's going to be a, um, a number of people in, on this call, when you say background product, because like APM is almost like a new grad position. What do you mean by a background product? There, is there like a degree in product or just like yeah, experience mean, running? Yeah, a there is now. Yeah, it, there is now. There wasn't back then. Actually, um, who has a degree? Is it, um, I think maybe is it Maryland or something? I don't know. I think there's a few schools now that have degrees. Actually, Carnegie Mellon's got a master's degree. Um, yeah, back then, I don't know how people, I mean, I think a lot of people got into product, you know, sort of the, the, they came in through something else. They were doing, you know, customer support or they were doing engineering. Uh, and then they sort of like moved over to products within their own company. But yeah, again, back then before the, when APM started, just started happening, it was really hard for people to get into product. Cause it was one of those things where it's like, you know, you must have experience in product, but nobody's got experience. Cause you know, it was, it was, it was one of those weird, like catch 22s. And so most people did it organically through moving over from engineering or, or the customer side of things. But now with the APM programs, it's getting much easier for people to sort of go right in from college. Yep. No, that makes sense. Um, do, so let's say, you know, you joined the APM program. I know the APM program is a rotational program. So you were able to join different teams. Uh, what were the rotations that you joined? And was there any, was there a reason behind if you were able to choose them? Was there a reason behind choosing them? Yeah, so correct. So at Google, it's um, the expectation was, and I, I assume still is, but I don't know for sure that you sort of rotate through two different ones, two different products uh, before becoming a, a full PM. Um, so I, so yes, you get some say in it. And the first one, I actually, the, um, Marissa Mayer was my, my boss. So she's, for those who don't know her, she was a VP at Google. She ended up being sort of the CEO of Yahoo. And now she's doing a, a different thing. Um, she, she wanted me to go and be um, sort of a, a second in command, so like sort of a junior PM underneath another PM named uh, Benjamin Ling. Um, he goes by Bling, sometimes B Ling, Bling. Um, and he was doing a product around like Google Payments, like Google Wallet, Google Payments, all that type of stuff. Um, and I didn't want to do it just for multiple reasons. One, because it wasn't quite as consumer facing, you know, it wasn't as more sort of like sexy, fun stuff, it was more like, you know, financial world. And also, I didn't want to be like second fiddle. Um, I think in hindsight, it was the wrong decision. I think in hindsight, like that dude, Ben Ling, for those that haven't encountered him, he's, he's just amazing. He's an, he's an investor these days, but he's extremely smart dude. Just, I think I would have learned a ton. Instead, I took my own product. Um, and I didn't have really anybody to learn from because of that. But 
the product I ended up doing was Google Groups, um, which was cool because I was the sole PM. Um, I, I was, you know, in charge of like literally millions of dollars of revenue and millions of users right out of college. So it was cool to sort of like be thrown in the fire that way. But, you know, I never really learned, at least, you know, early on, like how to do the job. Um, and then I rotated onto an ads product, mostly just to get like a really big variety, right? From Google Groups, which is very, you know, user focused to AdSense, which is, you know, part of the ads world. Um, and there, there are great experiences in, in so many different ways. Um, a lot of good learnings, uh, both in product management side, as well as, you know, from Google, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, that was sort of the, the, the history there. So if you were getting, you know, such a diverse experience and learning how to run a product, why, what, what motivated you to leave Google afterwards? Yeah. So, um, I started, I started just pre IPO. So literally I think one month or a couple of weeks before the IPO, there was, I believe 1800 people at Google when I started, which is big, um, but nowhere as big as Google is now. And so I, I started at 1800 people. Now, when I left four and a half years later, it was 20,000. So it was like a 10 X increase in people. And they're really doubling every year. So from two to four, four to eight, eight to 16. And then I left at, at 20. Um, but I left for a, a bunch of different reasons. One is, um, I was getting tired of, I was getting tired of like product management in a really big company. And I, I, a lot of it, it sort of changed from, you know, like being in charge of a product to more of like a lot of process stuff, like, you know, writing reports to your, to your bosses and, and just a lot more like reporting stuff and less of like what I consider to be the fun in the weed stuff. Um, also a lot, honestly, just a lot of my friends had, had left at that point. They wanted to, you know, try different things, different startups, et cetera. And, and I was feeling the same, like I was feeling, I didn't want to be at the same company for the rest of my life. I wanted to just see what else was out there. Um, and I, I'd, I'd hit my four year mark for, for investing or vesting rather. Um, and yeah, so all those things combined, just wanting to do something new, wanting to try stuff outside of product. Um, and also I was kind of getting burnt out of the Silicon Valley. So I wanted to, you know, explore somewhere new as well. And I, I found North Carolina and, and kind of fell in love with that as well. That makes sense. And so there's a lot of people on this call that probably are looking um, at APM programs and similar programs that what you faced in the beginning. Um, do you have any advice for people who are looking to, who are like kind of juggling, okay, between applying to very established rotational PM programs versus, um, and like, thinking of how to use that experience to set them up for a, a career in, in climate. Yeah. Yeah. So I just, so ignoring the climate side for a moment, like, I, um, there's a guy, Hunter Walk, he's a, he's another investor that I just, I, I just really love his views on everything from politics to, to startups to whatever. Um, he's, if you, if you don't follow him, I'd recommend following his, 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 I don't know, I think he's on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and everywhere. But anyhow, um, he talks about like what companies to, to work at right out of college. And I totally agree. And it's like, it's like a series B, series C company. So especially if you're like brand new to product management, you don't want to be the first product manager at a company. It, it, I alluded to it with my Google experience, right? Like you want to learn from somebody and it's hard to learn when you're the only product manager. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to be like a cog in like this massive, you know, mega corp. I, it's, I'd say the worst, honestly, is being the sole PM because you just can't learn. Um, in the middle would be, you know, a cog in a mega corp. And then, but I think best is like, it's really fast growing series B, series C, series D company. Um, and a lot of, a lot of people tell you that, cause it's like, not only are there some people to, to learn from, you're just, there's so much potential in a, in a fast growing company at that stage where they're like literally creating new orgs, right? Like maybe you're in product management and um, you learn a bunch and then they create a new like technical success org or a new customer success org or, or whatever. And it's like, as you grow with the company, you can even start those orgs. Um, but there's just so much room for, for horizontal movement in, in really fast growing companies. Um, as far as your comment about, or your question about like climate. Yeah. I mean, like clearly if you're doing like PM and climate, there's, there's two knowledge bases there. One is like, you need to learn the PM side, but you also need to learn the climate side. And so I think, yeah, I mean, you can, there's a lot more opportunity to learn the PM side in this world. There's, you know, there's still climate is definitely blossoming, but there's just still not a ton of, of climate companies out there yet. Um, so ideally, yes, would be a really fast growing climate company uh, in a BCD stage. But honestly, I think there's going to be, they're going to be very rare. So you might need to start on PM and then, and then move over to climate. 
That's awesome. Yeah. Now speaking of your PM journey for the next company, uh, what was Spring Metrics and what did you do in this role? Yeah. So Spring Metrics was after 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 Google. Um, there's actually a couple of really small startups in between there that only lasted a couple of months. But then I started a company called Spring Metrics. It's analytics for e-commerce companies, and I, I founded it in um, in Durham, North Carolina with three other guys. And so you know, definitely a bunch of lessons that maybe for another time about, you know, founding a company outside of Silicon Valley. Um, but it was, there, there's definitely some opportunities there in terms of, honestly, it's easier to, to recruit people when you're not fighting against the Googles and the Facebooks of the world, but it's also harder to raise money and, and harder to exit, honestly. Um, but, but yeah, so that was pure sort of B to SMB. SMB means small, medium-sized business for those that aren't aware. Um, so we were selling to small, medium-sized e-commerce companies and just, just super fun. Just like being a founder in a startup, um, lots of highs, lots of lows. Uh, we ended up getting to about half a million dollars in ARR. ARR means, uh, annual recurring revenue. So you know, we had half a million dollars of revenue coming in every year, uh, but then it kind of just flatlined. Um, and flatlining as a startup is a, is a death knoll. It's, it's, it's a problem. Um, and especially when you're not in Silicon Valley. So a lot of Silicon Valley companies, if you sort of get there, lots of times you'll just sell the company to, you know, a bigger company and, and just sort of get merged in. But when you're in the middle of nowhere, quote unquote, sorry, Blair, um, in North Carolina, then, um, then it's, it's harder to sort of get just sucked into a company like that. Um, but yeah, I honestly, I think that's probably where I fell in love with startups. Like I just, it's just so fun to, to be in a startup. And for me, I was, I was the product manager guy, but it, you do everything in a startup. I was doing, you know, calls with customers, sales, um, customer success, um, just, you know, everything from building the website to, you know, figuring out what types of desks we should have in the office, like just everything. And it's just super fun. I, I love it. That's awesome. Yeah. So then in terms of the caveat, I wonder, like, why did you leave Spring Metrics, and what were the biggest challenges that you you faced? Yeah, so the, the reason I left, all of us founders left is because we hit that flat line, we just couldn't grow it anymore, uh, and which means couldn't raise any more money. So it was it was as I said, making a half million dollars, which is enough to support at least a, a few people. So all of the founders left. We actually left the company. We still owned equity, most of the equity of the company, but we left the company to the head of sales and one customer support people person and said, Hey, try to grow it. If you grow it, great. Um, if not, it'll pay your salary. And so, so they did, and they, they, they kept with it for another few years. I think it just shut down about a year ago. Um, but all the founders walked away, uh, and, and joined other things. So not a success story, but good to be honest about the failures as well sometimes. So how did you find out about your next, I guess, PM gig where, you know, you joined uh, Pendo. Can you talk a little bit about what Pendo does and what did yeah. you do as your role as VP as well? Yeah. So there's actually a couple of things between Pendo. I was, I was, I was searching around. I, I did some consulting work. I uh, actually, there's a company in, um, in North Carolina called channel advisor. I actually jumped on there as a PM for a very short amount of time. And it's just oil and water, which is a really bad fit for me. Um, so I, I bailed out of that. Um, but then I, yeah, I did some consulting work and then I met, um, the founders of Pendo. They were, they were, you know, very early stage, but they were a little bit more, uh, I don't know, mature. I don't know. That's not quite the right word, but they were, you know, they weren't like 22 year olds. They were, you know, in their late thirties. So it was more of like a startup for, um, startup for adults, I think is a phrase we used early on. Um, and it was funny, they, the, the product they're building, um, and I apologize for any Pendo people, I'm going to botch this, but like it, it started out as like software for product managers, specifically like web analytics, like, you know, a whole bunch of tools around making your product, your, your product team better, um, web analytics, and eventually other things about sort of helping people onboard in your product and, and, and so forth. Um, but it's funny. So it was, again, the, the persona is product managers, which was appealing to me, obviously. Um, but three of the four founders were product managers at one point in their career. And so they hired me as a product manager, which in hindsight, I mean, not even hindsight, even at the time, it makes no sense. Like if you got three founders on the team with product manager skills, they don't need an, yet another product manager. Um, but I think a big part of it honestly was just opportunistic. Like I had the Google, I mean, just bluntly, I had the Google, the Google background and it helps for recruiting. It helped for raising money. Um, even literally now when you see press releases with Pendo, it says like founders from uh, Cisco, Red Hat, Raleigh and, and Google. And that's, that's me, even though I'm not founder. So it was totally like an opportunistic 
higher situation. Um, so, so yeah, I was excited about it just because like, I really liked the, the founders. Like I thought they were just really top notch, like just, you know, they knew what they were doing. And also, you know, the product space was really interesting to me. Um, and the, the downside was there in Raleigh, I lived in Durham, so it's like an hour commute, um, but decided to suck it up and do it. And honestly, I ended up actually loving the commute. I just listened to audiobooks and stuff during the drive. Um, but yeah, that's how I landed there. I, I also love commutes for the main reason that I can just, you know, splurge on all the podcasts that I, that I can yeah. watch, I can listen to. But in your role, uh, I, you, you joined as VP product, I, I believe. And what yeah, did you do role, it as I, part of that role? My official title when I joined was head of product. Um, I, yeah, I think it was like title list for like probably half a year. And then, it, then we all, I think a lot of us took like the head of layers, like head of marketing, head of customer success, and I took head of product. Yeah. Got it. And what did you do as part of head of product? Um, it was, it was a lot, I mean, it was startup again. So it was like, it was making product decisions. Um, but it was also just a lot of just like being on calls with customer with, you know, with prospects, with customers. So it'd be like the CEO and me would be on a call or the, the co-founder Raul and I would be on a call. So just a lot of just talking to customers. And then, um, we, of the four founders, one was an engineer and then me, and then they hired two more engineers. Um, so, you know, it's a lot of day-to-day -day interaction with the engineers. Um, we didn't have a designer early on, so I'd be doing like wireframes. Um, I, I pulled in a consulting consultant to help with design as well. But just again, like all the product manager stuff you do between communicating with customers, communicating with engineers, but all but all other stuff too, just because of the startup. And I, I kind of took the mantle of like culture. I just really love the notion of like building culture in, in, in companies with everything about like how we do that, the interview process to like how we decorate our office to like how vacations are structured. Just everything was just which is really fun for me. So um, there's a lot around that. And again, like that's the cool thing about startups is like you can sort of grab your domain, right? If like one person's really into culture, just run with it. If somebody else is really into like, you know, figuring out, I don't know, like your marketing material and you don't have anybody in marketing, just just grab it and do it. And that's that's a cool part of being a startup. It's it's the it's the blessing, the curse, you know, when there's like nothing defined. Um, but that that's <laughs> that's totally that's totally. And like uh, clearly, like there's a lot of people who just don't thrive in that world, where it's like you need your process defined for you, and like yeah. just know that's fine. Just know that about yourself. Startups not right for you, probably honestly. Like you need you need to thrive in ambiguity if you're going to be in an early stage startup. That's fair. It's also a process that it's also something that people can. It's not like you're not made for it. You can also with a bit of experience or. Um, exposure, you can get used to it. Um, kind of taking on from from that point where you were basically head of product, but you were very much in the details of, of the product. I think that was about the same about the time where you started thinking about climate change. Um, when did when did you start thinking about it, and how did you discover that climate was like a problem that was important for you? It was imp was an important problem, basically. Yeah. And there's, there's another thing I'll sort of mention in that time period, which is one is like, yeah, I was, you know, I was the first product manager and then I hired multiple product managers and I built like the design team. So I, I was sort of like doing the classic, like, you know, career ladder of like, you know, head of product, I, I got like the VP of title. I think I had like eight or so people reporting to me. And at some point I like had like the self-realization that honestly, I don't like the people management stuff as much as I liked like the product stuff, like just like work on a product. So we hired a, a CPO, a chief product officer above me. Um, I still managed some people actually, I, right when we hired him, I think I uploaded all my people. Um, I was doing sort of skunk work project. And then I sort of collected people again <laughs> under, under me and then tried to offload it again. So it's sort of this cycle of like, or, Naturally, the tendency is like as you're in a in a grown company, like people sort of they start to try to move you into management roles, and people fall under you. And I kept trying to push that off. It just I realized it, it was a self realization that I didn't I didn't enjoy that as much. And actually, again, like I'm just name dropping all over the place here. But um, what's his name? Uh, Ken Norton is a is a Google. Uh, is he still at Google? I'm not sure. Um, Iris, if you know, but he's he was a Google, um, and he wrote a really good blog post about like the the dual career ladders of product management how like an engineer is starting to have this where you can be an individual contributor all the way up through like i forget what they call them like you know uber super duper engineer and it's starting to do the same on the product management side which is pretty cool um, but that resonated with me which is i i like i like the, the the you know building product i don't like as much building the teams so had that realization and then as that was talking about yeah so this was about maybe five years in at pendo i realized i i don't i i want to i want to do something that just like very bluntly, like when I'm on my deathbed, like 
I'd be like, yes, like I made the better, the world a better place. And Pendo is not making the world a, a worse place. It's not like, you know, it's not like working for a tobacco company or, or oil company, sorry if any of you are. Um, um, but it didn't feel like it was like super mission driven, right? It felt like the mission was like to grow a, a cool big pro, um, company. Um, and so I wanted, I wanted to jump to something that was like, man, like I can just unequivocally say like, I made the world a much better place, or at least I tried to. Um, and so I looked very broadly, everything from like poverty to, you know, social, in, you know, social inequality to um, health to whatever and, and climate change for no real reason, just, it just resonated with me. Like I consider myself very like a, a, a nature loving person. Um, and so, so then I started diving deep on, on climate change again, still working at Pendo during this period. Um, and I, I went broad in, 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 in climate. In fact, I, like it is the only, only book I've bought in a lot, you know, physical book I've bought in a long time. And I, 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 I didn't have this here for this, this call. I just literally just keep it right next to me at all time, but it's draw down. Um, and it just goes super broad into climate. It's like, you know, here's like the 50 different things that, that you could, you know, work on in climate. Um, and a lot of them honestly aren't very applicable to people like me who have like software backgrounds, right? Like, you know, work, like improve cement, improve, you know, methane of, of cows, like super important things, but honestly, I, I can't do anything about it. Um, so I started narrowing in on, you know, a couple areas that I could help that were sort of more on the software side of things. Uh, I, I, I did think, you know, can I stay at Pendo and do this? Like, is there a, is there a way I could be sort of like the climate advocate at, at Pendo? Um, um, but it just, it honestly it didn't, it, it didn't seem likely like Pendo is just, you know, they weren't revenue positive. Um, you know, they weren't, they weren't producing extra money. Like they're trying to just like keep this as lean as possible and just like spending extra money to like employ somebody whose job it is, is not crucial to the company. It didn't seem like, like it was likely to happen. So, so anyhow, so I started looking broadly, um, I couldn't find anything in the North Carolina area. So I, I looked at a few places. There was a cool company I found that was doing sort of like long-term prediction of, of climate change on Colorado. And I found um, Arcadia in DC, which is doing sort of helping, helping bring renewable energy into the home. And that's, that's where I landed. So that was the next phase. What, what was the decision point for you saying, okay, cool. I'm ready for that next step. It was honestly like, it, I don't know if there's a single decision point. Like I, it probably would have been earlier, honestly. Like I, so I was, I was like Pendo for six years, I think probably at around like four years, I started just getting like antsy for the next thing. And I think a lot of us prime call are like that, you know, you're four years at a company and you just start looking, but Pendo honestly was really good about keeping me, keeping me there. Like they, they, like I said, they put me on sort of skunk work projects that got me sort of back into the entrepreneurial phase of things. Like I, I was helping out with like acquisitions and, and helping those acquisitions, you know, ramp into the company. So they did a lot of things to just sort of help me stay energized at the company, which was really cool. Um, so, so in a sense, you could say maybe at like four year mark is like when, when I started thinking about it, but pr not until actually about two years ago today. So maybe the summer of 2019 is when I started like actively doing the research. And again, there wasn't like, a, it's not like I had like a, you know, I walked outside and breathed stale air and I'm like, man, I've got to do it today. It was just sort of like, you know, it's like, okay, like I think now's the time. So, although I do remember going on one trip for, for Pendo to the San Francisco and just, I, I went during like a, the, a wildfire season and had to wear a mask in San Francisco. And that I, I lived in San Francisco for five years and I'd never had to do that the entire time I was there. And that, that one trip back with Pendo and like, holy shit, what's going on in this, this world. Um, so yeah. Yeah. For I sure. guess it'd be a cooler story if that was like my trigger point. Like I went on this trip, had to wear a mask out because of the San Francisco fires. And, and then I'm like, today's the day, but it was not the case. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's usually a gradual process, not like a <laughs> <laughs> light bulb moment, I'm going to leave this company. So yeah, I think once you've um, embarked on your climate journey and then discover your interest um, in the space, why did you choose to join um, Arcadia? And uh, what did you do as a senior PM? Yep. So it was uh, just bluntly, like, I didn't feel like there was a ton of choices out there. Again, with the intersection for me of um, I preferred East Coast companies over West Coast just because I was on the East Coast and I didn't want to be working remote for a West Coast company and, and dealing with like the time zone issues. 
uh, I wanted to be something software related um, and something climate related. And the intersection of those was, was fairly small at the time. Um, but I, 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 you know, did due diligence. I talked to investors. I talked to the team. I just really liked the people there a lot, honestly. I just like really clicked with them. Um, um, so yeah, so, you know, I, I started interviewing with them. They were mostly in-person folks at that time. Um, I was one of the only handful of people that were, that were remote. Um, and I, I'd never worked remote, but I decided to, to do it anyhow. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm totally glad I did it. I only stayed for a year and we can get into the why there if we want to, but, um, I don't definitely don't regret it. I, 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 I loved my year there. For sure. Yeah. So then, um, I think you definitely mentioned about like the people and the mission. Um, so you 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 mentioned that you also have like a few good leaders to follow at Arcadia. So yeah. <laughs> how yeah, do you absolutely. identify the good leaders to follow and what qualities do they have? Yeah, totally. So um, yeah, there's there's some definitely some really cool people at Arcadia, and, and just like the the mission side of things um, was was really interesting. Like I I actually remember like my uh, like a couple of weeks in, I went on a business trip with Arcadia folks um, to Texas because we had partners in Texas. It's, we had Arcadia is an energy company, even though it's clean energy and energy the the center of energy in America is still Texas, which is just so really weird to think about. Like you got to go to oil country for for meetings for um, for a clean energy company, but anyhow. Um, went to Texas with like three or four other guys. Um, they were all guys. Um, and uh, we are, you know, the partner brought us out to a steakhouse um, for like, you know, the, the meeting. And it was, it was really funny because I was talking to the other three guys from Arcadia and we all literally had the exact same comment, which is like, yeah, none of us are, are vegetarians, but we all tried to cut way back on red meat for, for climate reasons, you know? And so like we, you know, tried to eat red meat like once a, once a month. And it was literally like all four of us said the exact same thing. I'm like, wow, like, for better, for worse, I'm surrounded by my people, right? Like these are all like very similar, like-minded people, um, which was just, it was really cool. It was, it was different from Pendo. I, I love Pendo for many other reasons, but like, you know, things like climate change were just not top of mind for, you know, 80% of the people at Pendo. So it was, it was cool to just be surrounded by like everybody where like, honestly, you could talk politics and you know that everybody was like-minded politics at Arcadia because it's a climate change company. Um, <laughs> So, so yeah, so that, that was super cool. Um, but yeah, like really, like some really good leaders, you know, like founder, um, Kieran um, at Arcadia, just a super smart guy, um, super driven, um, knows the space really well. Um, it was, so, so jumping into like, you know, why I was only there for a year and, um, you know, Jess might be able to speak in, speak to this more, or maybe she wants to close her ears and not listen at this point. But anyhow, it was a weird year. 2020 was a really weird year at Arcadia. There was, a lot of turnover at the executive level. So literally a, a new head of product, a new head of engineering, head of finance, head of, um, <laughs> she just in the chat said second that, very weird year, um, head of literally everything, legal, everything. Because um, I think what happened was, and actually this is totally relevant to this crowd, is they they had a beachhead market because they're a climate company, right? So their beachhead market were like the eco warriors, right? The people who are really into like clean energy, et cetera. And they they rocked it. Like they they did really good getting to that beachhead. And then they just maxed it out. And again, this is this is my deduction. And Jess, if you if you feel differently, feel free to, to disagree. But I feel like they nailed that beachhead and then they flatlined. Like they just couldn't they couldn't get into the mass market after that. And that's what 2020 was all about. So there's there was COVID, which you know was really weird. There was that massive executive turnover because because of this this flatlining. They're like, okay, we need to find the product market fit that just that that maps to the broader market. Um, and so it was it was a weird year. I think if I had started two years earlier at Arcadia and I had sort of put down my roots, I would have probably stayed through you know past that period and just been like, okay, I got my roots. I'll stick with them. Or if I'd started after in like 2021, I'd probably still be there because it sounds from what I can hear, it sounds like they're doing well these days, but just when I started, it was just a bad timing. Um, and I just never set down roots and um, you know, I was ready to change it up. So it yeah. Me. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I think um, it's definitely a lot of turmoil happening in startups and sometimes <laughs> easy to lose faith. Um, so I'm curious about what, like, what did you go, how did you go about the next career search for, um, uh, carbon analytics, what attracted you about it? And why do you believe that it will make an impact? Yeah, um, so I, I quit, um, I quit 
Arcadia without the next thing lined up, which is always a little dangerous thing to do. And probably in hindsight, not the right thing to do, given um, that there's not, again, not, I feel like there's not a ton of, of places that are a good match for me. Again, software plus, plus, um, plus climate. So I, I, the reason I did is I did want to take some time off for family reasons. I have two young kids and I just wanted to spend some time with them during COVID. Um, so I, I went and I just needed a break in life. So I, I, t I planned on taking two months off. The two months turned to four months, honestly, because I just couldn't find the next best thing for me. Um, but I, again, just did the same search again, like, you know, talk to, talk to investors, just did just massive number of, of, um, networking type things. Uh, and I found a company called carbon analytics and carbon analytics is a hundred percent remote company. There's only four of us actually. Um, but I love the space. So th what they're doing is carbon footprinting. So if you're a business, like a small, medium sized business or a large business, and you want to know what is your carbon footprint you come in and what you'll do is you connect your accounting books to our, our software. So you say like upload your, your QuickBooks or your um, zero books or just a CSV upload or whatever. And we will look at all your transactions for the past year and say, okay, you spent a hundred dollars on, on, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, gasoline or a hundred dollars on, on, you know, food for your employees or $200 on, you know, cleaning services, et cetera. So like itemize all these things. We say, okay, this gasoline has an average footprint of this or average carbon emissions of this rather, um, you know, the house cleaning or uh, office cleaning has a footprint of this. And we can build your fairly accurate um, uh, emissions off of very little work from you. Again, just uploading your, your books. So it's super cool. And the reason I really love it is because it has the ability to span um, countries. So like, you all, again, all you who are, are interested in, in climate know that, right, there's like every country emits, emits carbon. Some countries are a lot more active about trying to, trying to stop this than others. So like we all share the same atmosphere, the same planet. And so you can have one country that's just polluting and doesn't care. And there's not a ton you can do about that. But the cool thing about what, what this, this company and industry does is if you, let's say you're Volkswagen in Germany, right, and you, you, know, you want your carbon footprint, but then, you know, if let's say Germany even says like, you need to be carbon neutral by 10 years from now um, to, to improve your footprint, you need your suppliers to be carbon neutral. That's like footprints basically bubble down to your suppliers. And so you start saying, okay, supplier in China, supplier in England, supplier in the United States, you guys all need to be carbon neutral too. So even though their country themselves, the United States, China, whoever, wasn't being proactive about, about you know, carbon emissions, because Volkswagen is pushing it down on all their suppliers, they now have to become carbon neutral as well. So it's a super cool mechanism by like for, you know, one company pushing down the suppliers, those suppliers then have to push down to their suppliers. You, you get this, this, you know, the benefits of, of globalization for once um, helping out climate change. So anyhow, super cool to me, um, really jazzed about, about the industry. Yeah, for sure. So it seems like it is more of a B2B model that you're pushing to these company um, who are like producing huge products and then let them to push down to their suppliers. So, but then usually getting the first step set up is usually the hardest one. Like how do you get the first company to believe in um, the importance of carbon footprint and really do it for their, for all of the yeah, product totally. and so the it is similar to Arcadia in that sense, where there are there are companies out there, just like how Arcadia had their like beachhead of like the eco warriors. There's there is similar on the company side, so there is sort of like these these seeds that are out there already. So, for example, uh, for those of you familiar with B Corp, B Corp is like this this I don't know what you call it, certification. I'm not sure what you call it, but basically it's this this way that you can run your company that says you know not only are you doing good for your your investors, but you're doing good for the world and when you apply to be a B Corp company, you get, you basically have to like get a certain number of points to qualify as a B Corp and you can get points in different ways. And one of the, the mechanisms, or one of the ways to get points for B Corp is by think, footprinting yourself. Um, so a lot of the B Corp companies already are already getting their own footprint. Um, so that's, that's a seed right there. But just in general, there's a lot of companies out there just saying like, I wanna be carbon neutral by 2020, 2030. And it is definitely more common in, in, in Europe, especially in um, the UK than the rest of the world right now. But there's enough that could be the seed, 
but again, all we need is a seed. Once you have the seed, they start pushing to their suppliers, um, which is which is super cool. And you're starting to see some of like these really massive companies in the U.S. too, like uh, like Google's and Microsoft's and Amazon's. Is a, I think Amazon, um, but yeah, like Delta, like all these really big companies that are starting to say like in ten years we're gonna we're gonna get there. And so they need to start pushing down on the suppliers to make that happen. Yeah, that's totally fair. Um, have you ever encountered a case where their profit is against ca carbon footprint, and then how do they deal with that? Uh, for for the for our own company, you mean, or are you for the customers that we're talking to? Um, customers, like their profit, yeah, makes them not want to get a carbon footprint or whatever you mean. Yeah, like when they when they face the conflict of making more money versus lower carbon footprint. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Um, I I honestly. I'm sure that I'm sure that's the case. I I haven't seen it firsthand yet. Um, I'll I'll just punt on that question. Is my is my short answer like I'm sure that's happening. I haven't seen it firsthand yet. Because I think that most of the people that we talk to, like the people that come to us, are the people who are in charge of the um, of getting you know of like their sustainability. That's that's it's often like the sustainability person. So I guess they are the buffer for us. So I'm not hearing their arguments with their CEO or their CFO or whatever. Um, we're, we're communicating with a sustainability person and they're already you know, trying to push it along. But yes, I'm sure that's happening. Okay, totally fair. Yeah. And how do you measure your personal impact as a PM in climate? Um, so like, okay, there's personal personal and then there's like personal professional, um, which maybe uh, that's a weird way of saying it, but like personally, I don't measure. I mean, like yeah. obviously I'm, 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 like I got, I really got solar panels in my house. Um, I drive like a hybrid car. I like, I, we were, before people got on, we we're talking about like public transportation. Like I, I try to like, I try to do things, you know, responsibly, but I'm not actually measuring any of these things. Um, even like, you know, meat consumption, like I've, I've definitely, I haven't cut it completely off, but I've, I've reduced my red meat significantly um, and my other meat as well. So, um, so yeah, don't measure personally, um, but just trying to do what I can. Uh, as far as professionally, it's interesting. Like I, I don't. I, I alluded to this early on in my my stories. Like I want to just at least try, right? Like I want to be on my deathbed and say, like I tried to make the world a better place. And like even if I don't succeed, I'm actually okay with that. Like I don't want to just like sit and do nothing. I want to actively try. But like as long as I feel like you no, know like I tried at a company. I tried at a few companies. We did the best we could. It turned out that carbon footprinting wasn't the right answer. It turned out to be you know, a brand new chemical that can replace oil. Like, I don't, I wouldn't feel bad about that at all, honestly. I, I feel like I at least was on quote unquote, quote, the right side of history and, and at least trying. Um, so, so yeah, so I think personal success is mostly just like doing everything I can, feeling like I'm contributing, making the company successful. Um, and, and that's the best I can do. For sure. Yeah, I think that's, that's all we're trying to do. And I, I definitely believe in, like small change add up. Um, that's also what I'm trying to do with Nutrify, helping people to reduce their meat consumption. So really? yeah. And what are the biggest challenges that you're currently facing? At that company? Um, um, yeah. Yeah, so the company, I think a lot of the same stuff that that startups encounter. I mean, one is like hiring. It's, it's interesting, like hiring is always hard, um, especially, you know, like, we're again like competing with the Googles and, and Facebooks and, and Amazons of the world who and, and Netflix, you know, who are paying ridiculous amounts for engineers. Um, you know, we have the one benefit that we are a climate company. So like there are some subset of people who will take, a, you know, not 100% salary, like some fraction of, of the market rate to be able to work on something that's really mission based. So, so that, that is the one angle we have. Um, but but recruiting is always hard. Um, Competition is always hard. Um, just the same, the same, you know, the same stuff that a lot of startups encounter. I think one thing that that Arcadia maybe actually encountered more than than my current company is like there's this always this like trust issue for companies that are trying to do good in the world, honestly, because there's like there's a lot of companies that are like you know greenwashing or whatever that real people realize like no what that that was bullshit. And I I think that was happening in Arcadia. Arcadia just totally like legitimately like, is doing good things. Like I, I, I don't want to make it sound like that's not the case. They are absolutely trying to do good in the world, but they're playing in a space specifically around like clean energy where there's a lot of bad apples, a lot of bad players. Um, and so there's a, there's a major trust issue there when 
they're going saying, hey, we can give you clean energy, even sometimes for cheaper than you're paying for your energy. And people are like, bullshit, like that's just not possible. Right? And you're not a nonprofit, right? You're a for-profit company. You're doing the world better and you're cheaper. Like, no, don't believe that. So, so that, is, that is an issue a lot of sort of climate or companies are, are facing, I think is like, are these companies, like, why are they, why are they for-profit companies for one? Um, and are they really legitimately helping the world or are they just taking advantage of, of the, the green movement? Yeah, totally agree. Awesome. That's all of the questions we have. And then now we're going to move on to um, audience FAQ. So we have, we actually have a lot of questions from both registration form and also the audience here. I think I'll let the audience here to do the questions first. So um, the first question I see is from Anna Dotson. Um, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yes, sure. Okay. Um, so I guess I'm wondering with your transition from like more traditional PM roles to the climate space, what are some big unexpected challenges that you're facing now? Um, and especially like when trying to design a carbon footprinter, like what are the what are the unique challenges that are associated with that and the risks? Yeah, I, um, for sort of making the transition, I mean, honestly, like, I I don't think there was that much of a transition in that, like, I, I've always been not a subject matter expert. I mean, I, you know, I, I the, before climate, I was doing things that, you know, I wasn't an analytics super expert. I wasn't an e-commerce super expert. I've always sort of been like a generalist PM and there are, you know, sometimes PMs are subject matter experts and sometimes they're not. And I've always been the, the not. So climate for me, was just, it was kind of just more of the same, which is like, I don't know the space really well. Obviously I, I tried to ramp up and, and I, and I did ramp up, you know, I know the energy space much better than I, than I, than I used to, but clearly there's people who know energy, you know, 10 times better than I do. Um, and, and with carbon footprint, I know it much better than I did before, but there's clearly people who know it much better than I did. So, um, yeah, being sort of the generalist non subject matter expert, um, I don't think there was that, that much of a change. Um, let's see other sort of other sort of issues. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I alluded to it before. I think it, to me, the biggest one was just like lack of lack of opportunity. Like, again, like there's definitely more climate companies now, but compared to like the number of non-climate companies out there, you know, like when I, when I just look around like Atlanta, for example, right? I look at like job postings, there's, you know, 400 PM positions. They're all, almost all of them are like optimized sales processes, optimized marketing processes, optimized, you know, like um, warehouse pipelines, whatever. Um, they're just not, much that I consider sort of a, a true climate, climate issue. So I think that's the biggest, the biggest barrier for a lot of us. There's yeah. a, yeah, go ahead, Iris. I don't know, you can go ahead. Sure. Um, you, I'm going to like, tr I think this question is a great way to um, answer this sort of question space more clearly. Um, Sha Shalini, um, you, you submitted a question. Would you like to unmute yourself and, and ask it? I think it's an important question. Yes, uh, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to find out if uh, we can uh, get in touch with you in case you're hiring. Uh, and also do PMs have to go through certification? Would that help in getting a uh, you know, foot in the door in these climates, um, startups or companies? Uh, for the first one, yeah, of course. So right now we're hiring a, a front-end engineer. We will likely be hiring additional stuff very soon, probably our first salesperson as well as some more engineers. Um, so yes, I, you know, love, love to hear from folks if they're looking. Um, in general, just reach out to me um, if you're, you just want to chat about climate or whatever. I'm more than happy to chat with people. Um, as far as like courses and certifications, I, I think it really just depends. I mean, like I, clearly I think there's some jobs that need deeper expertise on whatever it is, but whether it's like, you know, uh, you know, footprints to, um, you know, like how, you know, like air, direct air captured or whatever, like there's clearly some PM jobs that want the subject matter, matter experts. And for those ones, definitely think, you know, any, any deeper certification, et cetera, can't hurt. Um, but I think there's others that they just want a PM who's a PM, right? They just want like a person who can interact with customers, interact with engineers and figure it out. And, um, those have been the ones that I've, I've found a lot of um, out so far. Um, 
yeah the I'm trying to think um yeah it's, it's funny like i i certification i i, I shalini um actually i think works for a company that does that does courses and certifications so i don't want to diss them or anything but um you know like pm like people have actually for just like pm certifications in general right um there's there's um there's a you know like pmp or something like all these sort of like official like certifications you can get for product management and i i come from a world not saying that I, I think there are some companies that totally like those and like seeing those on your resume the companies i've worked for that's not the case like google didn't hire people who were like officially certified product managers um startups that i've worked for that has not been a thing so um it, you know if people are considering like should you get certified as a product manager I, I, as a hiring manager, I have not cared about those one iota, literally not a single, I, I wouldn't put you up even a single notch for having one of those backgrounds. I care about just entrepreneurial background because just being an entrepreneur, there's so much core, so much correlation between being a successful entre entrepreneur and being a successful product manager, it's just like doing whatever you got to do to make it happen. Um, having a broad knowledge of, of the business, et cetera. So a little bit of a tangent. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have my PMP and all the Scrum Master certifications, but yeah. you know, I, I I do realize they they really don't help. <laughs> and, you know, it's just a basic knowledge, but yeah, experience counts. So I've sent you a request on LinkedIn, but cool, awesome. I'd love to share. Yeah, Thank and again, you. like I'm not saying PMP and stuff doesn't matter for some companies. There absolutely are some companies that want it. Right. So, um, mm -hmm. But the ones that I've worked at doesn't help at all. Just, so people realize there are different routes there in life. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, and next we have a question from our registration form um, by Sun Wu Park. So do you think further education beyond undergrad is necessary to become a PM in, in climate? Uh, unequivocally, no, I don't think so. That was an easy one. <laughs> okay. I mean, PM in general, definitely not. Um, and climate, I mean, like, clearly, like, as, as I've talked about before, there's like generalists, and then there's specialists. And yes, like, I'm sure if you've got like a PhD in, in chemistry. There's some really cool like places that you could work at with like super deep subject matter expertise. Um, so that, I mean, that would be awesome. But obviously that limits your, it also limits you, right? Like that is gonna be, you gotta find a company that's like doing exactly that kind of chemistry and exactly that climate space or whatever. Um, whereas like generalists just don't need, don't need a master's degree, honestly. We've got, I think one Final question uh, from also the registration form. Uh, Camille Johnson asks, what is one myth about being a PM in climate that you found to be untrue? Um, or rephrase alternatively, what was something that you found was, you know, not like an, ex an expectation that you just felt that you found it was not true once you entered climate? Yeah, I don't have a good answer for that. I mean, honestly, I didn't, I, I don't think that I did have any preconceived notions. Um, Cause honestly, it's, it's still fairly new. Like, I mean, may, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like there's just still not, a, not that many of us. So it's not like there's, there are a whole lot of preconceived notions. It's just, there's not a whole lot of climate change companies and not a whole lot of PMs of the climate change companies. So, um, I think we are, we are setting the, setting the precedent now and setting the, the stereotypes now. Um, but I don't know if, if, if either of you two interviewers have any thoughts on that question by all means, or if anybody else, but I don't have any. Yeah, totally fine. Actually, I think there's one last question by Aaron um, in the FAQ chat. Aaron, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, you know, what uh, what podcasts you listen to? You mentioned it earlier. Um, what podcasts you listen to, and like, you know, any audio books or or books that you have read recently that um, that you'd recommend? Yeah, um, yeah. I I I wrote a medium a medium article right when I made this change. So it looks like December, 2019, and I'm pulling it up because I just listed all of them in there when I was doing it. Um, so I, I'm a huge fan of honestly of, um, my climate journey for, I'm guessing a lot of, you know, it, but for those that, that haven't, so it's the guy that started my climate journey. He, um, he was an entrepreneur, not in climate at all. He was a fitness app with my fitness pal, or I forget which one it was. Um, and he sold it and made a bunch of money and he was trying to figure out what to do next. And he went to climate. So he, he started by just interviewing people, which was super cool. He just interviewed people, record it and share it. And that's my climate journey. And it's, it's definitely expanded now. Now they have a, a, um, a Slack group and it's just like, just super, you know, tons of people in there talking about climate stuff. 
and they even have an investment arm actually now, and they, they invest in, in climate related startups. So, you know, my climate journey is definitely my, one of my top ones. Um, I'm looking at, so, uh, these are, these were older books, but I like them. So draw down the one I mentioned, uh, an uninhabitable earth. I like smart power more on the energy side, obviously super cool. Um, eco shot, uh, uh, clean disruption, superpower. So again, some of those are a little bit more on the energy side. Um, podcasts, I was listening to Interchange, Energy Gang, Energy Transition Show, again, more on the energy side than my climate journey. Um, so yeah, so those are a few of them. As far as anything like super new, I mean, I, the, I read the Bill Gates one um, fairly recently and it was interesting. I mean, it's, it's again, it's at some point, honestly, like once you've read a lot of these books, it's kind of just rehashing the same thing. And it's like, yeah, yeah, okay. I, I kind of got that. Like you kind of either have to go like really deep in a subject to, to start learning new stuff as a lot of the sort of the climate change books start just to be repeats. But um, anyway, hopefully that answers your question. It does, thank you. Yeah. Awesome. I've just launched a, uh, a poll um, for the community. We're, we're looking into um, producing uh, resources for the community to kind of like empower them as they make decisions as part of the climate journey. So um, we just, we're thinking of a few things and uh, if you can vote, that would be very helpful for us to know what to prioritize. Um, but yeah, back to Iris. And was that, so on that like PM salary survey, is that PM cli like climate yes. specific? That is yeah. climate specific. I should have, should have been. And, and the community there is climate specific. What's that, was that Iris? Oh, yeah, no, no. Um, so, I think uh, we are definitely looking to launch our PM climate guide soon. And we're also looking for um, like potentially more help if anyone's interested, but yeah. So let us know if uh, you wanna get in touch. And oh, I see a question from Shalini, any volunteer projects or gig resource? So, yeah, I mean, we, we are a volunteer project and there are a lot of climate projects on uh, work on climate as well. Feel free to chat more about it. And just to be conscious of everyone's time, I know our event has um, ended and we will host our next 15 minutes for just a quick networking for people. So if you wanna stay for that and wanna chat to learn about other people, feel free to stay. And if not, <laughs> thank you so much for coming. And I really hope to see you all soon for our next event. One last plugin. If you're not part of our PM uh, community, join us on Slack. Uh, and this is where we'll be sharing the recordings of this meeting and also the meeting notes so that you can learn about this and also be aware of future events as well. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me, guys. And uh, great meeting you all. And feel free to drop me a line if anybody wants to chat about anything we've talked about. But I will stick on, I'll stay on the line. Awesome. Do we have the result for the poll? Yeah, 40% uh, climate, uh, okay, I guess I'm the one who can see it. 40% climate guide and then 30% for both the salary survey and the community directory. Um, so overall 10 people uh, voted, which is, which is pretty I'm cool. I'm curious about the, like the salary, not just PM, but just in general, like I've, had, I've actually had this discussion with, with um, a VC about like, what is the delta between climate specific salaries versus, versus the general average like are they close to each other is climate way under i don't know i think Lindell, um who was our first speaker would know a lot more a lot more about this um she briefly mentioned how there's a lot of money in climate but you like when you work at a big tech or, or a company that your stock options are liquid you can cash out but when you work at a startup you can't cash out that easily so i think that's the main main difference um yeah but feel free to like add her on the Slack channel and ask her that question. Um, I'm sure a lot of people would be interested. So what we have so far is we've got 14 people on the call, which is awesome. Um, what we're thinking is we're going to break into two breakout rooms and um, Shannon, maybe like after five minutes. So at like uh, at 10 past, you can like switch between rooms and kind of like talk to some of the folks. Yeah. Awesome. I, don't, I don't know how, how to switch rooms, but if I can figure that out, then totally. You'll figure it out. Don't worry. You'll, 